how do I know what kind of future do I have in store knowing that I am in a pretty bad scenario? If you are in trouble sometimes, like in Ottawa right now, how do I see my future? How do I have a vision for my mission living in a time like this? How can I move forward? And so we all, in many times, when you take a look at our lives right now, we do live in uncertain times. Just this year, so many people are dead. You talk about the wildfires that have taken place in America, even in Canada. You look about the mass shootings that have taken place. Terrorism is at large. And then, of course, the, the threat of nuclear war with North Korea is looming. And not just North Korea, we're talking about even Russia and China. And we have a little India there as well. But how do we move forward knowing that the future looks a little uncertain and there's fear in the air? But how do we deal with this? What is the best way to move forward? And yet, continue to be God's people and love your church and love your city. How do we go forward? You know, it's funny, one of the things I like doing is I, I like reading signs outside churches. You, you know one of these signs they put up? Signboards meant to convict people, meant to persuade people, meant to bring people into the church. And yet sometimes it has pretty bad effects. Some of these signs, I just, uh, just to break the ice this morning, I wrote down for you. One of the signs outside an American church reads, now is a good time to visit. A pastor is on vacation. <laughs> so, I mean, you kind of get the feeling, I wonder what's going on in that church, right? <laughs> Another one, this is pretty bad. It says, whoever stole our AC units, keep one of it. It is hot where you are going. <laughs> Ouch! I can feel the heat from that. How about this? This is pretty nasty. It says, God wants spiritual fruits and not religious nuts. Whoa. And yet, these signs were to persuade people to come to church, maybe convict them, and yet, it has the opposite effects. It turns actually people away from God, away from churches, rather than bringing people to church. I like this one in particular. It says, I find your lack of faith disturbing. Darth Vader. You know, why have Jesus when we can quote from Darth Vader, right? You know, I mean, this, is, this is something that uh, I took out as well. It says, try Jesus. If you don't like him, then the devil can take you back. Wow. Can't imagine putting up those signs outside your church. Pretty scary, right? This is a nasty one. It says, choose the bread of life or you are toast. Whoa, 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 whoa. No wonder why there's no people in church on those Sundays, right? And they want to come on God. We're doing everything right. You know, but rather than what we're doing is actually pushing people away from God. And so today I want to talk about loving your city. And let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 29. We're going to look at a famous passage most often taken out of context. And that's the danger of this. And I remember as a young Christian and young intern, using this passage to inspire people, says, God has a plan for you. Smell the coffee, wake up, and not realizing the situation that the people were in. So let's open our Bibles and we'll read 29, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And this is what the Bible says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And so when we take this verse in its proper context, we do realize that the people living at that time lived in hopeless times. They lived in drastic times. Life wasn't easy for them. And so we're going to look at the, the story behind this verse and drop three simple points. I made my points a little bit more, more dramatic to get the message through. But the verses and the convictions that comes from it are all from God's word. Amen? Just to give you a, a summary of what's taking place, some 600 years 
before Christ. Babylon invades Jerusalem, destroys the city, destroys the temple, takes in a few from the royal palace, the prophets and some of the priests and a lot of skilled men. You can read all that prior to this verse. And he drags them into Babylon. And here they are, sitting in Babylon, and looking back all the time and wondering when is the Marines or when are the Marines coming to rescue us? And they're waiting and hoping and they're waiting and hoping and they stopped living life in Babylon. And all of a sudden, a letter from Jeremiah through God is sent to them in Babylon. And God gives them three specific challenges that I've written down today that might be useful for you as well. And we can apply it for our times in Ottawa in how do we love our city with all our hearts. Amen? You know, when, you, when they were in, in, in this foreign city in Babylon, everything was strange to them. It was a strange land, strange people, strange culture, strange language. The people looked very different in Babylon than from the Jews. And so everything was new to them, and so they missed Jerusalem. They were pining for Jerusalem. They wanted to go back. And then out of all this mess, we see God gives them three encouraging words, and at the same time pretty challenging because God was telling them, step up in your faith. The first point I want to make today is, he told them to stop being refugees and start living as residents. Turn from being refugees to residents. You know, I by no means want to make light of the refugee problems we face in the world today. It is sad. From the Rohingyas that have been moved out of Myanmar, okay, to the Syrian refugee crisis and the ones in Iraq, they suffer a lot. Families, male members are dead. Children and families are scattered, and it's painful. But when I talk about refugees, I'm talking about the mentality. One of the mentalities of refugees, and I've talked to a few people, is they want to isolate themselves. They don't want to mingle with the culture. They want to be a small population. It's the attitude of they versus us now in the new city. And they don't want to move forward. They want to protect themselves because they're fearful of the new culture they are, that, that they are in. And so they, they can't move forward and they're stuck. And during a time like that in Babylon, God gives them a word of encouragement. In verse 4 to 5, let's read Jeremiah 29, verse 4 and 5. And this is what it reads. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem. Who carried them in the very first place? Yes, it was the king of Babylon, but there was a bigger part that, to play, and it was God that was dragging them from Jerusalem, sending them into exile in Babylon. And God mentions that many a times in that chapter, reminding that it all along was the plan of God. He was working behind the scenes. Don't look at it as strange. Don't look like what on earth is going on. God was still in control of everything happening, whether it be in Jerusalem, in Babylon, or the rest of the world. God is in control. I think it's a reminder for all of us, no matter where we are at today, or whether it be in Ottawa or Toronto or Montreal or Quebec or even in Canada, no matter what happens around us, God is in control. And he tells them this in verse 4. Build houses in verse 5 and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters and find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number and do not decrease. This was a strange command in a strange land. And if you know the character 
of Israel, all they did and pined for was, we were missing Jerusalem. But they didn't realize Jerusalem was a worse off mess than Babylon at that time. Yes, it was a strange people. But God was telling them they were well off in Babylon. Start living life here. Don't be looking back. Don't be pining for home. Don't be pining for the temple. Yes, all that is sad. But why just survive? Start living life in Babylon. That was the command. He says, marry, build homes, plant gardens, have a great time. Populate the cities, make a difference, have influence. That was God's command for these people. Now, you want to know how they felt in Babylon. How many of us who grew up, okay, uh, listened to songs in the 80s, this famous group called Bonnie M. And one of their famous songs is, By the Rivers of Babylon. We can start singing it, right? <laughs> and so, so I want to take you back to Psalms 137 to give you a glimpse of their attitude here. Okay? And it says in Psalms 137, okay, this is talking about the time in Babylon by the exiles. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing for us one of your songs of Zion. Isn't that strange language? The attitude of the exiles in Babylon, they had given up all hope. They had hung up their harps. They had stopped singing God. They stopped singing to God. They stopped worshiping God. In fact, they were depressed. And then their captives looked at them and said, what is going on here? You should be happy in Babylon. Why are you sad? Let's, let's start singing the songs that you sang once back again, trying to revive their memories of back home in the new place. The captives had to sing the new songs once again in a new land. And that was a state that the exiles in Babylon were. You know, today, I think that's our challenge. God wants us not to be an isolated community, protecting ourselves and feeding ourselves alone, but to have fun on this journey called Christianity. <laughs> to marry, to build homes, to settle down. If this is the place that God has called you to be, bloom where God has called you to settle in. And if it is all over for the next five years, three years, two years, whatever years God has in store for you, live out life well. Be happy about it. Impact people around you. Okay, I mean, sometimes I ask Christians who walk around depressed. I mean, if people look at you walking down the streets, would they want to be inspired to come to your church? Because sometimes we lose out on this beautiful joy that we have in Christ. We are looking for something else. We are looking at the glory days rather than moving forward. And we stopped moving forward. We stopped living life. And what God was telling them, start living life. Whatever that means to you. Be happy. Be joyful. Have the fruits of the Spirit. Enjoy life right here in Ottawa. Have an impact in Ottawa. Just don't be looking back and wondering, okay, who's going to come? Who's going to help us? You already have the Lord Almighty in the place. Amen. You know, in your relationships, it could mean stop looking back and moving forward in your relationships. It means offering forgiveness. It could mean receiving forgiveness. In your marriage, it could mean being humble with each other. Not looking back, not looking back at the sins you've done and, and holding each other accountable and holding each other hostage sometimes, but moving forward for better times. 
This was God's command. Stop living like refugees to the exiles and start living as residents. Hold your head high and live out that life that God has called you to be. It could be maybe changing in your, in your personal life as well. Maybe there are certain sins you're struggling with. The new year is on the horizon. We've got to move on. Don't continue that into the 2018. And God wants us for a change. And he was trying to get the exiles in Babylon to change and not to sit there defeated. I want to challenge the church today, guys. Don't sit here defeated. The victory has already been won by Jesus on the cross. Yes, we are dealing with our own issues, but those are just smaller issues compared to what God has already done for us. The bigger picture. God is bigger than just the church in Ottawa. God is bigger than the churches in Canada. God is bigger than all the churches put together called the ICOEC or the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church. He is bigger than all of that. Get the bigger picture. And that's exactly what God was trying to imprint in their hearts. Get the bigger picture. You could be a blessing in Babylon, so live your life right. The second thing that he tells them, turn from being mourners to missionaries. Turn from being mourners to missionaries. And we go back to 29 there, okay? That was a small break that we took. And in verse 29, you know, can you imagine if you were the heroes of the first letter that was sent from Jerusalem to Babylon? It probably would not have gone down well with you. Because here you have your hunky dory about this rescue mission from Jerusalem coming in. The Marines are landed with their helicopters and their guns, and they're battling the king of Babylon, and they're ready to rescue you, and you're, you're hoping for that to happen. You, you can't move forward because thinking about your family back home your people's back home, your religion back home, your temple back home. And here they get this letter and God's telling them, no, 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 no. Settle down. This is where your new home is going to be. And he told them, stop mourning. Stop groaning. Stop grumbling. And start moving on to be missionaries in your new home. You know, it's funny because when you look at verse 7 and 9, let's read verse 7 to 9. And uh, where am I? That's right. It says in verse 7, Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I, again, which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Really? I, in exile, under a wicked leadership, pray for my king, pray for Babylon? Unheard of. I thought I should pray against it. And God says, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. Pray for your city you're in. It says, because if the city prospers, you too will prosper. If the city is defeated, you too, as a small little group of exiles, will be defeated. Isn't that amazing? It was as eight. He says, yes, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to their dreams that they try to encourage you with. They are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent you, declares the Lord. He tells them, you don't listen to people, okay, who tell you, in chapter 9, you actually see that Hananiah was a prophet there, and he tells them that, you know what, do not worry, he spiritualized everything, he said, don't worry, everything's going to be good, only two years, and there'll be a speedy revolution taking place in Babylon, and you will get back in two years. And God says, otherwise, and says, you do not Listen to the false prophets. Because I have a plan for you. Not two years, but 70 years in Babylon. Almost two generations. He says, this is not a camping trip I'm taking you on. You are going to be here. Don't carry your tents. 
Use cement to build your homes. Use something more permanent. 70 years was a long time. And that's exactly what he tells them in verse 10. 70 years, not two years. So do not listen to people. Because sometimes when you're living in desperate times, you're like the sinking man, drowning man, trying to hold on to anything to, to save your life. And sometimes you listen to things that are not from God. Because desperate times calls for desperate measures. And you listen to all the voices who shout the loudest around you. Because you're wanting hope. You want encouragement. But those are the times you've got to be careful. Is this the voice of God? You've got to ask yourself. You've got to question this. And so God was telling them, listen, man. Stop being mourners. Start being missionaries. Because you are going to be in Babylon for a long time. Now, funny, because God was affirming his relationship with them, even in the judgment. They were there because they disobeyed God. He was dragging them to the school of hard knocks. And sometimes God does that with us. When you're stubborn and I'm stubborn, and he's done that with me, God takes you to a place, the longer route, they call it. So he has enough of time before he brings you back to complete the task he has in store for you. But in the waiting, you trust God. In the waiting, hold on to hope. Because this is something that God wanted them to do. Be missionary. He says, pray for the city you live in. Because when they prosper, you will prosper. I am so guilty of this. I have bad-mouthed my leaders. Those in authority, whether it be Trudeau, I've at times gossiped about Trump. I know he's the butt of many jokes. And CNN, CNN doesn't make it any better. And how guilty are we as a church instead of praying for our leaders? We have gossiped about them, we bad mouthed them. Do you realize? that there are many scriptures in the, in the New Testament, forget about the Old Testament, in the New Testament, where the Christians were commanded to pray for those in authority? How often as a church, as Christians, we have failed at that basic command? Because this is exactly what God was telling them. Listen, you pray for your ungodly king. You pray for the people around you, because when they prosper, you will prosper. God said, you make a difference by the way you live your lives. You live like missionaries. You live sold out lives. Be willing to sacrifice. Willing to set an example. See, Jesus echoes this in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Right? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In Luke chapter 6, he says, bless those who curse you. Really? Do we do that? He's talking about enemies here. He's not talking about brothers and sisters in the church. How much more should we go ahead and love our brothers and sisters in the church? No matter what the problem is. Because at the foot of the cross, we are on equal ground. And we've got to understand that. Because I'll tell you one thing. The Bible is not the Bible if we do not apply it to our lives. We can sing all these beautiful songs. And Dwayne did a fantastic job where you sang the song, here I am to worship. And worship doesn't end after Sunday morning's church. Worship ends on the road way back as you meet at an intersection and some blow cuts you off. Worship starts there as well. Amen. Worship is in the homes, at your workplaces. Here I am to worship, not only on Sunday mornings in church, brothers and sisters, I hope we don't do that. We talk about belief, believing in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the unity, and stuff like that. Nothing happens if you don't apply God's word into your lives. And the Bible just says that. You know, it's so easy because our, our instincts is to operate on the flesh. And when, and when you operate on the flesh, it's, it's like you want to retaliate. You want to get back. You want to prove your point. You don't want to surrender. You don't want to be humble. But when you operate... On the supernatural, it changes your heart. Yeah. And when God was telling them, pray for Babylon, it was also meaning that when you pray, it also changes your situation 
changes the atmosphere, changes your emotions, changes your heart, and you learn to love instead of having hate. That's what prayer does. When you keep praying about someone, a particular person who you feel you don't like, and you pray for him, it slowly does something in your heart. And that's what God wants from us today. You know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light shine before others that when they see your good life or your good deeds, that they may give glory to God, your Father in heaven. Amen. Christianity is not Christianity if you don't apply it. Okay? There's a saying, I'd rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. The eye is a better pupil than the ear. Our kids want to see a sermon from their mom and dads than just hear a sermon. Anyone can do that. Hearing a sermon, applying it, takes the highest test of piety in your life. It is not easy to apply God's scriptures, but that's our test. That's the chance that God gives us. We've got to apply it. We've got to be like missionaries, and that's exactly what God was wanting them to be, to be different in a world going wrong. To make that change, let your light shine forth by your good deeds. You know, uh, one of the examples I want to quote is Hamid is, uh, is a brother from Peshawar in Pakistan. It's the border of uh, Afghanistan. And so what happened is one of the days he was called a few years ago, was called for a Thanksgiving Christian party in his friend's house living near the border where the Taliban lived as well. And they had their strongholds. And while they were singing the, and praising God with hymns, and they had the little band there, someone informed the Taliban that there was a small group of people singing songs, and they looked like Christians. They came in jeeps, brandishing AK-47s and swords, and took away all the men, including Hamid, who was in the church, in our church in Pakistan, a disciple in our church in Pakistan. And for over 24 hours, they battered them, they beat them, they, they threatened them with swords and they, with their guns, and usually they would leave one dead. In the process, they began praying, they began talking amongst each other, encouraging each other in a scenario like that. The government came to hear about it, and they began having consultations with, with these uh, Taliban people. And so it took about 24 hours, and finally they came to one offer. They needed a ransom for all the six brothers. And finally, they paid the ransom. The government of Pakistan, or Peshawar, paid the ransom. And within 24 hours, all the six came home unharmed. But that's not the end of the story. Hamid goes back and looks at his life as a, as a lease of life that God has given him. He felt like, my gosh, if, if God had taken me away tonight, I would like to ask myself, what have I done for the kingdom? What have I done for God? Would I leave a legacy that changed his entire idea of living life? And he said, I'm going to do something for God. Sooner or later, they, he, he was raised to be a family group leader. His son got baptized. His family now lead that little church, not church, the family group in that area, still baptizing a lot of people. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is the example of Hamid, he could have got discouraged. He could have gone back and said, man, let me move home. But he said, no, I'm going to stay here and continue being a missionary in Pakistan, which is a Muslim nation. If this is where God has planted me, I am going to make all the difference. How much more we living in Ottawa, where we, where we live in peaceful times. We have so much of freedom. And yet, at times, we fear preaching God's word. So what God was telling them is very simple. Guys, stop being mourners. Stop looking down. Start looking up. Have an impact. Start preaching the word. Start praying for your people. Make a difference. Let people see the quality of your life as a disciple. And that they may look at you and say, I want to know why you're so happy. In spite of your stress, in spite of your troubles, in spite of you being in exile, they would like to know what is your secret of success. And ultimately, it will point to the Lord Almighty. Are you living lives like that? And quickly, my third point. He tells them in the same chapter, 
stop being victims and start being visionaries. In verse 9 to 11, we come back to this famous passage. In verse uh, 9 to 11, or 10 to 11, this is what the Lord says in verse 10. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. And he goes on and says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me with, uh, when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. What a promise. God was giving them a vision of what it would look like after 70 years was completed. And as I said earlier, the 70 years was a hard school of knocks. And sometimes God takes us so that he can change our hearts. And that's exactly what he tells them here. That when you start seeking me, then you will find me. And I will bring you back from captivity. Not on their watch, but on God's watch. Not in their time, but it's all about time. And see, a lot of times we want something now. We want it now. We want to see things happen now. But what if God has another plan for you? What if God is waiting for you to change? Or the situation to change? Or the nation to change? And waiting, none of us like to wait. We don't like waiting at grocery stores, right? Grocery stores are a hard place to wait. We have bad attitudes waiting in line. Bus stops, we don't like to wait. We want the bus to come right now. And yet, sometimes, waiting is a very, very, very good thing. It's funny because when you take a look at all the men and women who waited, you'll find Joseph waited for so many years, I think 13 years. Moses, I think 40 years. Jesus, 30 years before he was glorified. Waiting is a good thing. And when God is making you wait, you are in good hands. It's not a bad thing waiting. Whether you're waiting for a baby to conceive, waiting for a marriage to get better, waiting for your finances to get better, it's a good thing. As long as you take it to the higher court and not to your local courts, I mean yourselves. So often we, we are looking for someone to help us out. No, go to the higher court. In 2016, I lost everything. One of my worst years in my life. My wife was diagnosed with tumor. I really thought that I would lose Rita. And we are not talking about in millimeters. We're talking about in centimeters. And a tumor that size in your brain is damaging. It was affecting her eyesight, putting pressure on her nervous system, nerves in her, in, her, in her eyes, behind her eyes. She was having splitting headaches. At times she felt like fainting. She couldn't operate, couldn't function. At that time I lost my job for really no fault of mine. If I lost my job because I was a bad minister, I would accept it. Because I have fired and hired people in my life before. But for no fault of mine, my son began to, to struggle spiritually, not doing well. At a point, I thought he's leaving God. It came so close, struggling with the world. And for us, coming from India, this was a no-no. My gosh, no, you got to repent here, bro. Come on, boy. But it, 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 God was working in a different way, and I had to learn that. My daughter was very discouraged. She came home. She was living with the Brits boys. Danny was good to us to keep her at home. And she said, you know, Danny, I can't live here knowing my mom and dad are struggling back home. And she came home to live with us. It was a very, very challenging time. I, I said, Lord, what are you teaching me? And at, at a point, I realized, man, I'm becoming like a pagan here. I'm not praying enough. I'm, I, I'm, I'm actually having these bad attitudes, these, these, these negative thoughts. I mean, I've got to go beyond this. It took me a while to realize, come on, man, I am not going to let the devil take hold of me. I'm going to the higher court. I am going to go to God. It took me a while. It's amazing how God navigated this entire process. I came out of it, built up friendships with Hamilton and Waterloo and now served there. You know, 
a few months ago, the leadership came to me and they apologized. You know, I could have taken matters into my own hands. I was thinking about all my options out there. Because in Canada, you're very well protected, right? You have a lot of resources. But I told myself, I'm going to go beyond this. I will go to my God. And if it means I have to wait, I will wait. My wife was livid. She was mad. Come on, can't you do something? You know? Why are you not reacting? I'm so indignant. This should never happen to us. Where is their conscience? I said, let's not go there because then we are falling right into the devil's trap. Get ourselves out there. Move along. Let's go to God, even if it has to wait. You know what? It took two years before all that changed. Funny today, I am applying for the same job. I'm not sure I'm going to get it or not, but what I'm saying is how God works. If you give him time, he has the best in mind for you. Waiting is not easy. But in the wait, be godly. In the wait, be righteous. In the wait, be hopeful. Because that was the, the message for the ones in Babylon. I have a vision for you. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, you might not see the results immediately. You might not see the benefits of all that you do in your life as a disciple, loving God, immediately. Because you must understand, some of these men who were sent into exile and women would never see Jerusalem again. They would die in this new land called Babylon. But he said, even in the judgment, your future is going to be great. See, sometimes we as a church, we don't think God generationally. We think God for the moment. Because that's all we can see because it's a lack of faith. But we got to look at God generationally because God lives outside time. As I said earlier again, he does not operate on your watch. He works outside time. It could be a year, five years, ten years, seventy years, seventy-seven years. But give him that because he keeps his promises. He was telling them indirectly, man, your children are going to benefit. I'm going to gather people from all the nations and bring you to this homeland called Jerusalem. And you will be a great nation. For now, live your lives having hope and having a vision for yourselves. I think we need to live like this. I love this quote from the exotic Marigold Hotel. How many of us have seen the movie? Oh, I, I know. All the oldies put up their hands. I'm sorry, guys. She says this to, to, to one of the, the servants. Everything will be all right in the end. If it is not all right, then that is not the end. Because the end is the most important thing. I mean, I like what Corey, Corey Ten Boom said. Trust your unknown future to a known God. Corey herself was in concentration camps as a Holocaust victim in, in Nazi Germany. And she suffered a lot. And she was a great Christian. And she had hope waiting upon the Lord. And so I think for us, that's a great question to ask ourselves. Are we trusting an unknown future that we have right now to a known God? Because that's what God wants for us. God wants you to trust him even in the challenge that you face. And so I want to end with this, end with this um, passage I had for you. I had a question for you. I'm going to look for that paper that I had. You know, how does God look at a church? If, God, if Jesus had to visit our church this morning, brothers and sisters, would he be shocked or would he be amazed at the great work that we're doing in Ottawa? Would he have a word of challenge for us or a word of encouragement for us? You know, I remember a church in Ephesus in the book of Revelations. And God said, Repent, and he gives them a warning in Revelation chapter 2, the church in Ephesus. Change. Change is always better. And that means whatever you have to do within the church. Because he tells Ephesus, I will come and remove your lampstand. 
It looked like it was hunky-dory at that time in Ephesus. And many years later, this word did come true because when you look at Ephesus today, modern-day Turkey, there's no more church in Ephesus because God did take away his lampstand, his presence. You know, we live under grace this morning, and we've got to take it seriously. This is God's church. This is not your church. Okay? This is God's church. He is the architect of the church. He sacrificed his son for the church. He is the only one that builds the church. The Bible says, I think in Psalms 127, unless the Lord builds, the builder labors in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand in vain. No matter how skilled you and me are, no matter how strong we are, and with all these weapons that we have, nothing will work. Everything is vanity if the Lord is not 101% in it. You cannot run a church by methods. You know, I like one of the quotes. I always keep remembering this quote because it, it, it's a challenge for my own heart. God, uh, the church, I'm sorry, the church and men are looking for good methods. God is looking for a good man. Yeah. A good man is God's methods. Yeah. Yeah. And today I want to leave you with this challenge, guys. It's the same challenge that the exiles in Babylon faced and God encouraged them. He said, live your lives well. Marry, settle down, have an impact in your new home for the next 70 years. And then he tells them, be missionaries. Live life, inspire, live such good lives that you will have an impact on the Babylonians. And before you leave and exit Babylon, you will make a mark in Babylon as God's people. And then he tells them, have a vision. He gives them hope. I have a hope, a plan for you. And I do believe for Ottawa, God has a plan for you. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some hard work, some unity within the group. You know, it's funny enough because in John 17, Jesus' biggest prayer was all about, I pray for the unity of my people. Do you think he had an inkling of what could happen in Ottawa in 2017? I'm sure. It's just human nature. But I do believe you guys are in good hands. I, I know the leaders are praying together to work this church out. I know Montreal is supporting us, uh, Toronto. I'm praying for Ottawa. I'm praying for your leadership. I'm praying for the unity. It does seem that it's taking a turn for the best. And God has a plan and God has a hope for you guys. This is the capital of Canada. Not any old city. Let's shine forth. Let's be like the stars in the sky. Let's hold on to the word of God. Let's love our cities. So when people come in, there won't be any weirdness in the church. They will see us hugging and kissing. They will see us, man, we truly believe what we read in the scriptures. We truly sing those songs because we live out those songs in our lives. We've got to apply that to our scriptures today, to our lives today. Thank you for your time, guys. Have a great Sunday. And hope to visit you guys sometime soon. God bless.